is a Meet ECU lecture. Um, so, uh, my name is uh, Kim Knudsen, I'm head of the PhD school in uh, ECU Compute and co-organizing this uh, series of lectures together with the Research Academy, uh, who's uh, Philip Bill is the director there. So, uh, the intention of this uh, series of lectures is to have some uh, nice introductions to hot research topics given by experts uh, in our department. And for that reason, I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome you, Barbara Weber, uh, from uh, our department. Barbara is a professor uh, in uh, software engineering and the head of the section uh, there as well. She's been a professor in our department for uh, a couple of years already, since the beginning of 2016. Yeah. And uh, before then, she was an associate professor, assistant professor, also took her PhD in uh, Innsbruck. So, uh, yeah, Barbara is an expert in uh, how to bring humans into the loop when we do talk about software engineering and she'll tell us something about that. Thank you for coming. Please go ahead. Thanks Kim for the uh, introduction. Um, yeah, as Kim already mentioned, I will talk a little bit about human um, aspects, a topic I'm uh, very much interested in and a topic which I strongly believe also has a really societal um, impact. So um, one of the problems we are facing today with the economy more and more based on software, that industry is like desperately um, lacking uh, software engineers and wherever you look, the world is really looking for uh, software engineers. Most of our students already have like jobs aside while studying and there is a, also a strong push onto ourselves to educate more software engineers. At the same time, um, I don't believe that it's just a quantitative problem. It's also a problem which has to do with like quality and productivity. And that's a topic which has kept software engineer engineering researchers busy already since a very long time. And um, there are numerous studies that confirmed order of magnitude differences among software developers in terms of productivity. So you can read many times about factors of uh, 1 to 10, which are really like uh, written down. But uh, when you talk with practitioners, those uh, differences might be even uh, bigger. And already like 30 years back in time, it has been recognized that one way to improve the productivity of uh, software developers is, uh, and also the uh, quality of software is to focus more on human aspects and human factors. Um, and this has also been recognized by the uh, Manifesto for Agile Software Development. I would assume most of you have already um, heard uh, um, about it, maybe also uh, read it. And um, if you look at this line over here, it reads individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And it clearly states that in order to be successful in a software project, you can have the best tools, you can have the best software engineering processes if the people forming part of the team, if there are issues there uh, in terms of qualification, but also in terms of how they interact, then um, the best tools and the best processes, they won't help and there's a very high probability that the project is going to, um, to fail. Still, uh, when we look at software engineering research, um, traditionally there has been a very strong focus on technical aspects, like if the usage of test-driven development is going to improve uh, quality, um, there has been work on uh, refactoring formal aspects, and um, only very recently there can be an increased focus on human factors being uh, observed. Uh, and this is somehow this, this need for more um, research on human factors that's also um, highlighted in a recent uh, article by uh, Robert Feld and colleagues that somehow proposed that there should be um, more emphasis on human factors and that uh, we should start at collecting um, psychometrics, so data about uh, personality of developers, also about um, attitudes, motivation, emotions and so forth in order to better understand um, success factors uh, for uh, software development. 
Um, and you can um, find um, uh, st uh, studies, recent studies that are somehow picking up this uh, idea and are also like able to establish the link in this case between um, emotions and the ability to solve problem, uh, to an uh, analytical problem solving task, something which is really crucial for uh, software uh, development. So it's a um, recent article by colleagues from uh, the University of Bolzano in Italy, like showing that happy developers are better problem uh, solvers. And what they essentially did is that they asked people to um, um, execute a problem uh, solving task. And in addition, they collected a um, couple of uh, uh, psychological um, um, yeah, uh, data. In particular, what they what they looked at is is a is a, a, a scale looking at positive and negative effect, uh, meaning uh, um, yeah how how positive or negative the uh, the person was uh, feeling, and they could show that people that are happier they are also better at um, solving uh, problems. Something which I think has not been um, at, uh, uh, addressed just um, until uh, recently, and it's also a little bit against the common intuition that the only thing you need in order to be a good developer is you need to be uh, smart, you need to have um, high cognitive abilities, and then things will go well. But as you can see from this research, also the uh, emotional dimension is quite um, important. So there is more and more research um, uh, tapping into this uh, potential. But what I believe is that this that we are just scratching a bit on the uh, surface and that there is much more um, uh, possible, especially when using uh, neuroscience and psychophysiological methods and uh, tools. I'm just uh, showing a few examples here. So this includes, for example, the usage of uh, eye tracking technology. Can also be like um, EG, um, galvanic skin response, heart rate variability. So, um, so there is a whole range of um, uh, measurement tools available that allow to um, measure both the cognitive and the emotional state of um, people in a more objective way than using um, questionnaires. And what I would like um, to do in the like, next maybe 45 minutes is um, to explain uh, this potential a little bit better. Um, so there is very big potential on the one hand from a design science or engineering uh, perspective, so how to build better uh, software systems using uh, neuroscience and psychophysiological methods and tools, so that will be the one uh, um, aspect. But there is also a very big potential for a, a um, better, deeper, uh, theoretical um, understanding of um, what's going on while people are developing uh, software. And I will start um, looking at the role of the uh, brain in both information systems and uh, software engineering uh, research using a, a framework um, colleagues of uh, mine uh, from uh, uh, Austria and Canada uh, published. So um, whenever we are talking about software engineering or IS uh, engineering, there is always a central um, IT artifact. This can be a running software system, that can be a piece of soft, uh, source code, or it can be a model, like a UML model, a process model, that is used in parts of the development uh, uh, process. Um, and when interacting with a design or IT artifact, there is typically activity going on in the brain, which we can observe using uh, neuroscience and psychophysiological mes uh, methods uh, and tools. Um, this uh, um, activity is usually then like reflecting in terms of feelings, in terms of beliefs, uh, attitudes, behavioral uh, intentions, which are usually measured using self-reported uh, questionnaires, just like in the example I showed about uh, uh, the impact of emotions on problem solving. And then there is um, IT uh, behavior, so actions a user or developer is taking inside of uh, 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 
the IT system. Um, so that can be um, interactions, clickstreams, navigations, decisions um, that are made um, inside of the IT system. And that's a part that can be observed, for example, by uh, logging user interactions, by logging uh, clickstreams on a website. And then there are these long-term effects of using IT artifacts onto the brain like, for example, uh, the effect of using mobile phones or the effect of using um, social media onto our brain. So this, that's the uh, long-term uh, perspective. And what I would now like to do using this um, framework to go uh, to zoom in um, a little bit uh, deeper and um, talk about different contributions um, neuroscience and uh, psychophysiological methods and tools can make within that um, framework. And I will start talking about the theoretical perspective. And when we look at this um, figure over there, so then um, one of the um, theoretical uh, um, contributions can be to essentially use um, brain activity as a mediator in between the IT artifacts and the antecedents of um, IT behavior or the IT behavior itself. Um, so what's done uh, in that field typically are, are, are mapping studies where brain activity is essentially mapped onto different uh, regions of the brain in order to better understand which kind of processes are involved in particular uh, tasks. Um, also, um, neuroscience and psychophysiological me me uh, methods and tools can help to better understand what's going on um, or what's the influence of the IT artifact onto the IT behavior and to essentially open up this black box. Um, then it also becomes uh, possible to measure, um, typically uh, to measure constructs that could not be measured um, otherwise or that can be measured in a more um, a reliable uh, uh, way using neurophysiological um, methods and uh, tools. And then there is this long-term effect, which is also um, an aspect uh, that, that falls into this uh, more like theoretical category. And I will now um, look at a few um, existing works, um, some Others have conducted some that are done uh, within the uh, software engineering section in order to um, highlight those possible contributions a little bit better. So um, I mentioned as a first contribution, brain activity can be used like as a, a mediator in between the IT artifact and the um, IT uh, behavior. And there is, um, very recent work that has been um, published at ICSE, that's the premium software engineering uh, conference, doing an fMRI study. So they did some uh, brain uh, scanning. And what you can uh, see over here are essentially the brain regions that are activated during source code uh, reading. And um, those regions that are highlighted here, those are regions that are to, um, involved with uh, working memory and um, divided attention, uh, but also like uh, language processing that is necessary in order to conduct tasks like that. Based on, uh, on those uh, observations, they also came up with a bottom-up uh, model, bottom model for program uh, comprehension. So that's not something which is like fully confirmed. That's essentially... Um, the way how they um, envision that program comprehension is uh, taking place um, in, our, in our brain. And uh, what we essentially do according uh, uh, to this research is that we are analyzing words and uh, symbols, reading the source code, that we then like integrate uh, that into um, higher level pieces like statements and semantic chunks of source code. And in parallel to that, um, there is also a, a memory uh, needed in order to keep the uh, values and the words in mind in order to essentially understand what's uh, happening uh, in the program. Um, and then based on such a model, it also becomes like um, um, uh, 
possible to somehow reason about different um, influences. So for example, if we are now increasing the number of variables, and that's exceeding essentially the capacity we have available in our uh, short-term memory, then it might become very difficult for the person to understand the uh, source code. And that's also where techniques like refactoring are coming into play in order to keep down the uh, complexity. Um, but up to now, there are only very few studies going into, uh, like, looking at brain activity uh, in the context of um, programming or software development uh, activities. So another uh, contribution um, I see is like an advanced theoretical understanding in between IT artifact and ID uh, uh, behavior. And like more specifically, that's a question we uh, addressed um, in my um, old team uh, in Innsbruck, but that's something I'm now uh, continuing here at uh, DTU. That's the question, what mechanisms um, are, 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 are there um, that um, somehow can explain the influence of cognitive load on the quality of the ID? Um, artifact. Um, so you might have noticed that I slightly changed this illustration. So the arrow is now going back in here into the ID artifact because when we deal with process modeling or programming, not just source code reading, um, using user interactions we are essentially continuously changing the artifact and with that also the quality of the artifact. So it's uh, more or less a, um, an, an iterative process where the uh, a design artifact is step by step developed. Um, and in that context, so we looked into process modeling, which is sort of uh, interactive design activity. Uh, programming would be another type of interactive design activity where you essentially start from uh, requirements from a requirements uh, description, then you have the design activity it, itself, which I'm here illustrating as a black box, and the output is the um, IT artifact. In this case, it's a process model, but it could be well, uh, as well um, be a piece of source code um, or a UML model. And in order to conduct such a design activity, it's uh, on the one hand necessary to build an internal representation of the requirements, a mental model, and this mental model is then externalized uh, using an IDE, a development platform, and this uh, externalization process is typically restricted or constrained by the modeling notation or the programming language you have available, and also by the tool support that is there. Um, in order to be able to somehow observe the IT behavior, we um, um, essentially used the design platform we developed in uh, Innsbruck ourselves, which is able to not only produce the final model, but is uh, essentially logging every single um, user interaction. And it's also possible, like in a movie, to replay every single step that happened during the creation of the design um, artifact. And here you can just see the different types of uh, interactions that are recorded, creation of elements, deletion, but also operations related to the layout. Um, and now uh, cognitive load comes into, into play because uh, when we are interacting with a design artifact and we are conducting a task like um, creating this uh, design uh, artifact, this task imposes cognitive load um, onto the uh, limited information processing capacity of uh, the brain. So I guess you have uh, heard about this famous uh, seven plus minus two chunks we can essentially keep in uh, short-term uh, uh, memory. And um, 
and depend and, and the cognitive load is essentially is to some ex somehow in very intuitively explained is is measuring the capacity that is ex is essentially uh, used in order to conduct a particular task it's an in individual measure um, so it, dep it depends on your individual um, capacities and uh, on the one hand very importantly cognitive abilities working memory but also executive um, uh, functions and at the same time also uh, modeling expertise or domain knowledge because this allows you to use your um, capacity more effectively because you can you have already built up schemata so higher and you can group the information in a different way and there are also task specific factors so the difficulty of the task itself the inherent difficulty and then there can be extraneous load produced so load on top of that uh, depending on how the task is represented and also depending on the uh, platform on the modeling language programming language and also the tool support that is um, available um, but if you remember we are in a setting where the artifact can also be altered so um, this inherent complexity, it's not, it's not something which is staying the same, but since the design artifact can change, also the difficulty to already understand what is already there can change. And that's, for example, why it's so important in software engineering to, um, for example, invest time in refactoring in order to keep the code uh, simple, in order to ensure that everything remains uh, readable. So we have these modular-specific factors, task-specific factors, and also the artifact itself inducing uh, cognitive load onto the uh, developer. Um, in literature, there are a bunch of uh, uh, tools available in order to assess cognitive load. Some of them are su subjective uh, ratings using uh, questionnaires. Some of them are performance measures. So performance in, in this setting, you would like, uh, while you're doing your ordinary task, there would be a secondary task running in parallel and the cognitive load would be um, uh, measured in terms of how well you are performing in those secondary tasks. And then there are behavioral or physiological measures to assess cognitive load, like heart rate variability. You can use eye tracking, in particular pupillary response data, or blink rates, um, EEG, and also galvanic skin response. So in our setting, we used um, pupillary response uh, data in order to assess cognitive load. Subjective ratings were not usable because we wanted a continuous measure and you cannot ask the participants every minute about the cognitive load that would be too intrusive. Uh, performance measures are also very intrusive and not very realistic because there's always a secondary task running in parallel. Um, then what remains are the behavioral and physiological measures that all are able to provide continuous measures, but uh, some of them are um, sensitive to, um, to movements, which um, in a programming task cannot be completely avoided. Um, and also, um, for example, EG, it's quite intrusive and not very um, realistic. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's um, and that's why we, why we went for uh, eye tracking, in particular pupillary response data, which is known to be a reliable measure for cognitive load, especially if you're able to control uh, the light conditions. Um, what has been established in literature for many domains, that cognitive load is a very strong predictor for task performance. But it's not a, as you can see in that slide, it's not a linear relationship. So there is an underload region on the left. That's the region where you are completely bored. It's so simple that you are not concentrating on the task. And then there is the overload region. 
um, where you are getting close to your capacity limit. And what, what you can see from that uh, illustration is that especially in the underload and in the overload region, errors are very uh, probable. In between, that's the region where, you are, where the demands of the task essentially match your abilities. And the big question now is, if we are developing software, are we ending up in this overload region where errors occur, or are developers somehow able to modulate the cognitive load by um, adjusting the way how they are interacting with the um, IT artifact? And that was the question we were essentially um, looking at. We uh, measured cognitive load in terms of pupillary response data, and we asked ourselves, what is the relationship between cognitive load and the quality of the design artifact? So assuming that overload happens, then there should be, um, um, then you would expect a decrease based on the theoretical um, um, input I've, I've shown based on that uh, illustration that there should be a decrease in task performance. But we are not sure if cognitive overload is, um, is happening during this long running task. And I think what's important to mention, people are able to adjust their IT behavior. They can also externalize what they have in memory by putting a couple of elements onto the screen or by writing up a few lines of source code, which essentially um, uh, releases some capacity in working memory. So, so is there cognitive overload happening or, as illustrated on that, that slide, are people using compensation strategies like sketching, creating partial solutions which are then refined and um, spending more time? And in that case, you would not uh, expect any impact on task performance because the uh, developers are essentially remaining in that region in the, in the middle. So what we did is that we conducted a modeling session with 117 uh, novice modelers, so people rather inexperienced, and they had to create a process model using an informal um, requirements description. And uh, we measured continuously cognitive load during that entire uh, process. And what we found is that there is most probably not any overload happening. So people were not constrained in time. There was no time pressure. They could spend as much time as they wanted. The task was not overly complex. And um, it seemed that they were pretty much able to compensate. And what we saw in the data that there was like a very, um, uh, that, uh, that there was a relationship between high amount of uh, sketching and uh, cognitive load and also uh, spending more time. So there seems to be evidence that people were applying some compensation strategies and it did not really materialize in errors. And I think it's, an, um, it's, a, it's a finding that has several uh, implications. On the one hand, I think it's very important that IDEs are very uh, well supporting um, the externalization and you really can develop uh, in a very um, um, iterative uh, way that you are able to like, break down um, information into smaller chunks if needed. And I think it's also important for teaching that we are like looking into how can we teach this type of uh, strategies to our students that they are like able to uh, deal with the uh, challenges they are like facing when, when conducting complex uh, design activities. So that was one of the contributions like which goes more into this area of providing a theoretical understanding. Um, looking at that study, um, it also allows me to, to highlight one other contribution, 
because using um, uh, the self-reported measures or using this dual task paradigm, the question we were looking at could not have been investigated because they don't provide unintrusive continuous measures of cognitive load. So this continuous measurement is only possible using um, neurophysiological and or psychophysiological uh, measurement um, tools like pupillary response data, but you could also use um, others like HIV, EEG, and so forth. But I think it shows the potential neuroscience uh, um, and psychophysiological mes methods and tools have to investigate constructs that we could otherwise not uh, investigate and to investigate them in a more um, automated and unintrusive way so the user doesn't have to answer uh, um, questionnaires all the time where he or she is interrupted, but it's something you can like measure in the background. So these are um, uh, theoretical uh, contributions. But there is also a whole bunch of contributions from a design science perspective, so from an engineering perspective. Um, so on the one hand, you can use, when you're building um, an IT artifact, a system or a model, you can use um, neuroscience literature to, in, to guide your design decisions. And so every engineer knows that there are, a ton, there are tons of design decisions on the way. And for many of those design decisions, neuroscience literature can help to make that decision. Um, then there is um, the possibility of uh, um, using uh, uh, brain activity as a way to evaluate different alternatives, different design artifacts. Um, for example, which one is better in terms of cognitive load? Which website is um, creating more feelings of trust? So these are questions you can use in your evaluation. And then uh, comes the development of um, biofeedback systems, of uh, neuroadaptive systems, where um, the signals are essentially used to um, um, somehow derive your emotional or cognitive state and are either providing feedback on that or are even going one step further and are adapting itself. And then finally there are brain computer interfaces where, the, uh, um, where you essentially use the brain as an interface instead of a mouse or keyboard. And I will um, in the next like remaining maybe 10 minutes, uh, show a couple of uh, contributions from the design science uh, perspective, um, starting with the design of um, IT artifacts. Here it's a very simple and trivial example, but I think there are um, many different um, yeah, other design decisions where uh, neuroscience can inform. Um, so for example, um, you might have observed that in many of the uh, tools, um, boxes are nowadays curved. Um, there is a, a re a neuroscience research um, explaining why humans prefer curved objects rather than sharp angled uh, ones. So it seems if the objects are like sharp angled, that there is an activation taking place in the um, amygdala that's a part of the brain which is related to, to fear, fight and flight responses. And so that part is essentially triggered if we are like faced with a sharp angled uh, um, yeah, objects. You also might have noticed that it, like in architecture, uh, that there, are, there, there is um, a lot of usage of rounded forms which are creating a bit more of a harmonious uh, feeling. And that's something which is um, supported by uh, neuroscience uh, research, just to give an example. Then as another contribution, you can uh, use uh, uh, your brain activity and conduct a brain-based IT artifact um, evaluation. 
And I'm using an example we just very, very uh, recently did. So um, what we essentially wanted to um, um, identify, so there are different visualizations out there. Um, visualizations, um, data visualizations that are really getting more and more crucial with big data. But uh, which ones to take? And um, sometimes there are alternatives for doing exactly the same task. And uh, in order to better understand what's uh, happening um, in the decision-making processes when, diff when using different uh, visualizations, we essentially conducted an eye-tracking uh, study where we presented different visualizations and asked the participants different questions about these visualizations. Um, and then we analyzed uh, the data on the one hand uh, looking at um, fixation data, so where on the screen did uh, the participants look, and we did some statistical analysis. But what you can also do is um, to um, create models, so we use process mining, um, in order to um, illustrate in a graphical way the um, decision-making processes or the reading pattern that are induced by the different types of uh, visualizations. And this helps you to understand if a visualization is effective in order to conduct a particular uh, task. And you can analyze very easily if the visualization guides the user to the parts that are relevant and this allows the user to discriminate between relevant and not relevant parts or whether the visualization forces the user to always look at all the information. So that would be an example of using, um, um, in this case, eye tracking in order to uh, evaluate different um, IT artifacts, different alternatives that are uh, essentially able to do the same. Then there are biofeedback systems. These are essentially systems that are um, collecting biological uh, signals from the user. They are then typically showing the, these signals on the screen and the user is then uh, able to um, essentially change his behavior in order to um, somehow change the signal. So for example, you could uh, use that to, to show uh, stress and, uh, and then the user could, for example, if, if, if the stress level is getting too high, take a little break. Um, so these type of systems are already, um, like I would say there are a lot of them already um, out in form of uh, variable devices where you can uh, measure um, all sorts of stuff like your heart rate, your pulse, your heart rate variability, and you can somehow look at this information on your mobile phone. What I personally think is more uh, uh, interesting from a scientific point of view are neuroadaptive systems because they go one step further. They're not only measuring, but they are also trying to derive uh, from a biological signal a mental state. Can be an emotional state, can be a cognitive state. And then the system is adapting based on the user's uh, mental uh, state. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, go here a little bit deeper. That's something which does not really um, exist yet, but it's something we would like to, uh, to work on and the bits and pieces are already in play. So one is this um, measurement of biological signals. Again, cognitive load as an important predictor for task performance, but you could do exactly the same for other uh, signals like stress or, or for um, different um, emotional states. But in this case, cognitive load because of its, uh, um, uh, yeah, because of its predictive power for uh, task performance, especially when under 
time pressure. So what you would do when developing such a neuroadaptive system, you would typically collect data from different mod uh, modalities, not only eye tracking, but maybe also HRV, maybe also uh, EEG to get uh, more data. Um, obviously, the data has to be uh, uh, synchronized. And then the next step, and this is really the tough one, is to um, derive the mental state from the biological uh, signal. On the one hand, that involves like removing um, artifacts. So for example, in eye tracking, um, you need, uh, when, you use, when you do uh, eye tracking and the user is um, blinking, uh, you need to, for example, um, remove blinks um, because otherwise it would mess up with the data. So there's a lot of cleaning uh, necessary. And then what, um, in, in that case, what we are really interested in, it's very rare that programmers are getting into underload with programming because the task is too complex. But overload could be a problem, especially when under time pressure. So we would like to detect when the user is approaching the uh, overload region. Um, and what you would do essentially, or what you need to do is, is essentially using uh, digital signal processing pattern recognition in order to detect a uh, pattern of cognitive overload in that uh, system. So what, before that's possible, what you typically would do is that you would do an experiment where you intentionally induce cognitive load, where you can be sure that the user is getting into the overload state. And then you would uh, use machine learning and train a classifier in order to be able to detect the, uh, these um, states you're interested in. And then once you know, okay, that user is in overload, that user is stressed, that user is now really frustrated, then it's about deciding what to do, how to adapt the system. And in my opinion, that's even tougher. If you want to do some specific adaptations and not just some generic like recommendation, uh, take, take a rest or it seems you are stressed, relax a little bit. So if you really want to do something specific, the system needs to be able to understand the context in which a particular mental state was observed. At in the context of um, software engineering, creation of uh, artifacts, it's essentially about establishing the link between the artifact and the sensor data. Uh, so uh, you always need to know what was happening in the artifact um, while, for example, a particular overload uh, state was uh, detected. So for that, you need to be able, f f uh, f in the context of programming, to link source code and eye fixations. So you need to know at every moment, where is the user looking in the source code? Was it now this if statement in the code, or was it, um, uh, was it a very tough loop? Then it's also relevant to know um, which subtasks a user is just engaged in. Is the user testing? Is he reading the source code? Is he refactoring? Um, so what could the challenge be about? And then, since we know that also the IT artifact itself could influence cognitive load, it's also interesting to know uh, how the quality of the artifact is. Is the source code very clean and very nicely written? Or is there maybe a need to do some cleanup in order to be better able to read the source code? So there are a lot of, um, I would say, unaddressed uh, challenges in here. So it's um, um, highly interesting, highly challenging. And as you probably also could infer from my presentation, it's a highly interdisciplinary effort not just involving software engineering. So there is neuroscience, there's 
cog psychology, cognitive psychology. There is definitely also like um, um, machine learning in there, dig digital uh, signal processing. So that's not something you can do just from the perspective from one discipline. So it's always an interdisciplinary um, effort, which makes things uh, really interesting. So, uh, um, so I hope I could illustrate. Um, with my presentation that human factors in software engineering require increased uh, attention. But uh, I hope that you could also uh, uh, see at least a bit the potential of neuroscience and psychophysiological methods and tools, both from a theoretical but also from a more engineering uh, perspective. Um, as I mentioned, there are many interesting challenges that require highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, research uh, efforts. So there is a lot of space for very novel and creative uh, research in that space. But um, as I mentioned, it's, um, yeah, it requires a lot of people uh, from uh, various uh, disciplines. Um, so on the one hand, uh, uh, people I already worked with in Innsbruck but there is also um, more and more collaboration going on, especially with the cognitive uh, systems uh, section that is working on many areas that are highly relevant in order to tackle these uh, challenges, hopefully jointly. So I'm now in time <laughs> at the end uh, of the presentation. And there is, I think, still a bit of time to take some questions. Thank you very much, Baba, for a very interesting uh, lecture. So we do have time for uh, questions. Uh, so <clears throat> I thought that the, the true power of using like, physiological measurements would be to tap into something that the user is unaware of. But I would think that the cognitive the cognitive are low, at least when I, I try to do some coding, I'm, I'm usually quite aware of where, where I am with the cognitive load. So if I feel stressed, I'm aware of it and I can go and take a cup of coffee. So would I what what increased benefit would I have if So, 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 so uh, I, I guess it, it, it probably depends on a couple of things. So I don't think everyone is aware of, uh, is always aware of how stressed or how challenged um, he, or, he or she is. So especially for, for, for stress research, there is evidence, so there is literature that, uh, that the subjective assessment is not as reliable as, um, um, as neurophysiological uh, measures would be. I would also think with emotions that not everyone is always fully aware of, um, yeah, of how, the, how the state is. Um, and the, so with those biofeedback systems, I, I guess it's, a, it's, about, it's a measure about creating awareness. And then I would, would also say it probably depends. It's maybe not something for everyone. I have a comment. You can go and have a coffee, but I guess the guys in the support factor in India or any other country they don't have a chance of even raising their hand and, oh, I feel stressed. So yeah. In that situation, it's still it's too good. And, 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 and maybe coming back to the question, I think where, where I see the biggest potential for that, like especially with the cognitive load, it's, it's, it's with people learning how to do it and about giving them, so, so, so I talked about this adaptation, but, but instead of like doing a, a, like a whole adaptation, it also could be an intervention. Like telling the person learning how to program 
maybe you want to look at, uh, at your source code and do some refactoring because it seems that you are somehow stuck. But I think in order to be useful, the key is that we are able to know what the challenge is about. Because otherwise, if it's like with the, um, so we all know from, from Word, this little, uh, the recommendations, they were very much annoying because they, were not, they did not really fit the needs. And I think that's really the biggest challenge, to be able to, to a, I would say to a reasonable extent, predict what the challenge is about. And that's, in my opinion, at the moment, completely unsolved and not fully clear if it's going to be possible. Is this a question here? Yes. Uh, have you considered uh, things like um, users uh, strongly typing, as I say? Uh, uh, so, so like mm. when somebody's getting irritated, they might uh, mm. do something that can be... Uh, I mean, that, that could be uh, also very strong. Mm. Um, so, so one of my one of my uh, stu students uh, um, w wanted to implement such a uh, yeah the, um, um, su such a measure to measure the, the, the yeah the, essentially the, the pressure is one way to see if people are like getting uh, frustrated. Uh, but I think it's a very good good point, and that's uh, that's something where you don't need neurophysiological measures. But if we are able, in some experiments beforehand, to correlate that stepping, for example, with cognitive load, then we might be able to uh, use some uh, simpler ways, like like the tapping, to infer some states. So, for example, in some settings, um, I think in, um, it has been shown that the location of the mouse to, I think, 70% or so indicates also where you're looking for particular tasks. So in many cases, you can somehow approximate neurophysiological measures with, with some um, measures that are more like in the realm of IT behavior. Here, yes, do you foresee a scenario in which each uh, software developer auto monitors it itself, or a scenario in which the management has a big guy, uh, a sort of big brother yeah. looking at everyone? Um, and, uh, the second case, do you think that this could have some problem from a, from a legal point of view? Um, I think that would certainly have et ethical issues, and that's not a scenario <laughs> I would, I'm, I'm aiming at. So I'm more, I'm more aiming at, so, so I have a scenario in mind where the data is, uh, belongs to the person being, being, uh, being tracked and also has full control over that data. And it's more like a tool for, Im for improving. I think as soon as that, uh, um, as that is not the case anymore and, um, and the management would uh, know about those measures, I think, that, I, I think that would be highly critical because some of those measures, so for example, heart rate variability, it's also a measure of cognitive load. But with heart rate variability, you can also see, for example, when people suffer from de de uh, depression. So, so I think it's, it's some of those measures are highly, highly sensitive and so, and, and I would certainly see uh, ethical issues if, 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 the, if those pri privacy aspects are not taken uh, uh, seriously enough. Mm -hmm. So, thanks for a nice talk. I, I actually, I have both a comment and a question. So, the comment is that I think that when you look at programming languages, it's kind of interesting that a lot of the, the development actually seems to go towards reducing cognitive load. Where where one fun thing is perhaps these uh, forced indentation in, in Python, where they've basically taken out something that, that, that people usually have to think about, like where do you, how do you indent, indent your code. And I think there are many similar examples where the cognitive load is being reduced by information hiding and other mechanisms. Uh, but, but the point that I actually wanted to, to ask you about is that uh, when, when, when I do some task that has some high cognitive load, it usually goes very well if I get a reward. If I can see something working, and then uh, my brain releases something because he works and I'm happy. 
Uh, and, and otherwise, there's this other level of distractions that, that I think human beings have this tendency to very easily be distracted, especially probably if cognitive load is high. So it seems to me that, that sort of like analyzing cognitive load, you must also look at things like rewards and distractions. And, yeah. Or, or at least that to, to control for the motivation of people participating in your, in your uh, measurements. I mean, one thing I observed for myself, so I once was asked by a colleague to participate in an experiment, which was very well within my uh, capabilities, but it was extremely exhaust exhausting because um, you had to concentrate to such an extent because it was so messy. So he looked into layout of models and he had very messy models. And what happened to me, even though I did very well, I started to feel bad. Because I had the impression, um, since the load went up, I had the impression, so the wrong impression that I'm not doing well. And I guess if you don't have like sort of um, a motivation to somehow finish, I think there is really easily the tendency to just say, I don't want to do that. So exhausting. Yeah, I have two questions. So I was wondering um, what your control conditions for these kinds of studies. So like, there's a lot of inter-individual variability in cognitive load, but also intra-individuals. So what's yes. like the reference point that you compare? So, that, that, so I think, uh, um, are you talking about this? Uh, this biggest, biggest study where we looked into the relationship of cognitive load and task performance. Um, for instance. For, yeah. so, um, so what we, for, first of all, what you need to do, since it's a personal measure, you always need to do some baseline measurements of cognitive load. And in your measure, you're usually, um, you're usually looking at changes when compared to the baseline. So you cannot just compare uh, two uh, cognitive load signals from two persons. That's highly critical. Um, and, but we also measured um, other, I would say, um, more, more or less all those factors you have seen that have an influence, like um, um, domain knowledge and expertise, like cognitive abilities in terms of uh, working memory, reasoning abilities, executive functions. Um, the task complexity was, that was controlled but there was a whole range of controls um, um, on, so on top. Like, what is the baseline condition that you compare? So there are, there are different, different there are different ways how to do it. Some people use an um, empty empty screen. So we had a working memory task, and we used so we used the task with some um, high amount of processing as the baseline. Yes. I thought about looking at this uh, disconnect between the measures you would get from your objective measures like heart rate variability or pupil dilation and such and subjective measures. So in other words, seeing if there's a disconnect between how people are aware of the cognitive load or their stress level and what you get out of the objective yeah. measures. Because maybe there's, maybe if you're aware of your stress level, then, um, of course, you can regulate that better than if you're not. Yes. Aware. So if this, if this is something you've also thought about looking at. <laughs> so in other words, comparing subjective measures of questionnaires or something. Um, so, so in our, in our study, we also used a subjective um, measure in addition to that. So essentially, we collected pupil response data. We collected HIV, but this data is not um, analyzed yet and we collected such subjective measure. The subjective measure did not work at all because it's not, um, it's not a short task. It was like a task of half an hour with the complexity going up and down. And if you then have, uh, if you then have a subjective measure, it's just not, it's just not uh, re reliable enough. And, and I think research also has shown there is a tendency with those one-time subjective measures that it's more like measuring big, um, big load rather than 
Right, so I meant it more like as a tapping into people's awareness. No, that's not something we, we, we looked at uh, in, in, in this study. So if it's shorter tasks, like you show a model, you ask a question and then ask how was it? Um, there it seems there is a much better connect between the perception and the objective measurement. But there it's, it's time-wise much more immediate, much shorter. Um, but for the long running task, uh, yeah. that, didn't, that didn't work out, no. All right, so uh, I suggest in the interest of time, so it's now two o'clock, that we uh, close the, the session. I'm sure Barbara will answer any other questions uh, just after here, or she's in 303B in the ground floor, so uh, please go find her there. Uh, I suggest we thank Barbara once again. So.